I wanted to ask you uh, how you grew up. Uh, I have, uh, I, as I started, you know, I started kind of life just like many of you, just kind of a normal middle class kid, you know, in southernmost Illinois. Uh, my mother and father were not well educated. My mother had a high school education. My dad, again, in his generation, managed to get to eighth grade, but then had to go work on the farm. Uh, but my dad was a self-educated man. He got himself very literate and was able to get his real estate and insurance licenses. And so my dad was involved in real estate and insurance. My mom was more or less a stay-at-home mom, but then it got into the idea she really enjoyed caregiving and health care. And so she started working at the local hospital. So I had a, a fairly normal, you know, like I say, just middle-class life. Didn't know any different, right? And then and when I got to be about 13, Madhu, uh, within a period of about five and a half months, uh, my mother had a catastrophic, just an incredibly bad fall and totally broke several vertebrae in her back. She was nearly paralyzed, uh, took multiple surgeries to get her back up, uh, became just uh, for a period of about two and a half years almost an invalid, uh, just trying to get her back healed to the point where she could stand without pain. Think about that. <laughs> just stand without pain. Uh, about five months after that happened, my father had a very catastrophic stroke and didn't detain him from his physical opportunity. He could still walk, still could see, what have you, but it drained his mental capacity. He was no longer able to work, no, no longer able to take the rigors of what it takes to you know, do the books and all the things that it takes to be in insurance or the real estate business. And so at age 13, I became the primary caregiver and breadwinner for my family. I was very fortunate. I was a fairly large kid. I'm a rather large adult in some ways. But what I mean is I was about 5'7", and I was about 165 pounds. I could do a man's work uh, at age 13. And I had a whole crew of people in our community and neighbors that would come and get me and let me work on their farms. Give me employment. Come, come, Ron, come today. Come this afternoon. I need some work done in the barn. Come do this. Come do that. And between that and taking, you know, going to school, uh, we were able to get enough money scraped together uh, to be able to keep the family going. That went on for about two and a half years until I graduated high school. So working every weekend, working most nights, uh, as you can imagine, not much of a social life, so to speak. Uh, but we were able to, to make it and to get by. What about your education? Uh, again, I was, uh, it's kind of one of those funny things. The, uh, I managed to get through high school, with, with, you know, with no problems. Grades were not stupendous. I was one of those young children, maybe you're one of them here, you know, that kind of gets bored real easy. Kind of like new stuff and different things and what have you. I got bored real easy. My grades are okay, but I had to take my, my uh, ACT test. It's the, what's the new equivalent to that? that they SAT. Do? Yeah, the SATs. Yeah, you know those? I had to take them three times, not because I didn't pass, but because I got too high a score. My guidance counselor thought I cheated. So I had to take them three times. The last time I took it, she sat in front of me while I took the test. So I had good aptitude, but was busy with other things while I got my high school education. That then put me in a position where I wanted to go and continue my education. I'm a curious guy. I love, to, I love education. I love to learn things. But in my day and time, you, you got to realize, folks, I was, I was born in the, in the era of BI. You know what that is, right? BI? Before the Internet. There was a time, you know, centuries ago, years ago, <laughs> when there was no Internet. So we didn't have the ability to take classes online. You had to go to school. You had to go to the college. And so it took me 13 years to get my undergraduate degree. One class at a time at night. But I was very fortunate. I got a great engineering education, got a job with uh, this wonderful uh, Fortune 200 appliance manufacturing company called Whirlpool Corporation. And while there, got another undergraduate degree in human resources management, always interested in that technology human interface. Got a management science degree, a master's degree in management science. And uh, just a few weeks ago, got to the point where I'm now ABD 
I love those letters, all but dissertations, for a doctoral program at my tender age uh, in public administration, a focus in sustainability. So that's been my course. That's been my journey. Always a learner, a lifelong learner. So, uh, uh, Ron, I, I met you about 11 years ago, and uh, I have been doing poverty simulations for almost 20 years, and um, uh, Ron was sent to me as a replacement to do poverty simulations. I didn't know it at that time, and it was like you're, you were put on earth to do it. And uh, uh, Ron has traveled with me to Uganda, Tanzania, India, Mexico, so many different places. So, and then he's been a community educator as well for the University of Illinois Extension. So the question I have for you, Ron, is why did you even look back? Why didn't you just leave all this and just run away? Uh, and I appreciate that question. Uh, it, it, uh, not only Professor Madhu, but other people ask that kind of same thing. Uh, you know, when I left Whirlpool Corporation, I started as a project manager for Extension, University of Illinois Extension, in those poorest counties that I spoke about near where I live. And the reason for that is I realized how important the people around me were when I was struggling, when I was really stressed, when I was really experiencing this great depth of need, how people gave me a, a method, a way, a way out. They didn't give me a way. They gave me the directions to get out. Come work and earn money, and that will get you out. Come take education, that will get you out. And so it was the people around me, Madhu, that actually made the difference. And I've always wanted, you know, my life mission statement says that, you know, I'm gonna, my, my life's going to be gauged by the benefit and the development of the people around me. That's how I gauge my success, by your success. And so those people that invested in me, I wanted to be that person for other people. And uh, again, I've been, I've been fortunate enough to be in positions to be able to offer those kinds of things. There's one uh, interesting thing you've told me that you learned from your father. Uh, you must uh, mention that. Yeah. I, I will, and uh, again, you've got to realize while I'm here, you know, uh, I'm, I'm privileged enough to stay, as Professor Madhu calls it, the Rondo Condo. Uh, I'm staying with Professor Madhu, and we have often, you know, several opportunities to have interesting conversations. But I was relating to him how uh, one of the people who influenced me greatly was my father. Uh, not because of his great intellect or his great prowess or his generosity or anything like that, but it was the fact that my dad saw people ubiquitously. Everybody he saw literally was a potential client, a potential customer, someone that he wanted to make sure he knew and he could relate to. And it didn't matter where you lived or, you know, what side of the tracks you were from or what nationality you were or what your ethnic background was or what your faith or religion was. It wasn't that he didn't care. Uh, we had a group, the, the singular incident very quickly was, in this day and time, we were still burning, again, this is in the dark ages, right? In the little house we were renting, we were still burning coal. We had a coal stoker, which is this thing that you put this little chip coal into it, and it goes and feeds into a furnace and keeps your house warm in the winter, all right? The people who were delivering the coal were, were uh, two black gentlemen. Again, you must realize southernmost Illinois is not the most racially diverse community. We're very very homogenous where I live. But I remember the fact that the people who came and delivered our coal left, and about 30 minutes later, it was raining outside, what have you, just, I mean, just a horde, like this morning. A horrible day, right, outside. There was a knock at our door. It happened to be the two black gentlemen who came and delivered the coal. And they wanted to know if my dad had seen any money laying around outside. They had somehow, in their haste, managed to lose the money that my dad had paid them for the coal. My dad put his hat on, put his coat on, got his galoshes on, and went outside and spent 30 minutes trying to help them find the money. That taught me a lesson. It's one thing to say, but there's another thing to do. And I'm very proud of my father for being able yeah. to, to inspire me to do, yeah. and to be about doing rather than just saying. Yeah. I, it's, it's very moving. A couple of days ago, Ron described his father as the first person he knew was not bigoted. Yeah. That was very powerful, very powerful. So, well, Ron, you are an inspiration.
uh, you know, I, I, I would put you in front of any audience, and I have in Uganda, Tanzania, or, you know, Chicago, so on. Uh, and, you know, there are some people in life you meet and you wonder what life would have been if you didn't meet them. And Ron's one of those few people for me. He's a brother from another mother. So thank you very much uh, for making the trip as well. I'm going to let the students. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to let the students ask any. You can ask any questions you want. Stupidity. No. Uh, again, I've always been someone who's been curious. Uh, and I think that's one of my hallmarks. Is just, I, you know, I find something that's like, hmm, that, that's interesting. Uh, when, when computers first became kind of available and what have you, I got really interested in how people were going to use them at work. And uh, again, the company I was working with, we had the, the opportunity to do a lot of work and a lot of really interesting things about trying to understand how people and computers were going to interface with each other back in the 1990s. Yes, those days, <laughs> you know, when the Internet was just an idea. Uh, but it's, it's been, it's always been my, my goal to do that, and it's more about, and I will tell you in your education, it's great, it, it helps to be brilliant. I want to tell you, for all you brilliant people out there, God bless you. You know, it's wonderful. But for the rest of us, hard work does pay off. And if you have a good instructor and you're in a good program, the instructor and the program will give you the fundamental knowledge you need to be successful in that class. Okay? It's just that you have to make the application and be able to do it. That's, I would say, my story. Other stories probably vary. But anyone else? While we have a yeah, moment. Yeah. Oh, 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 yes, please. No, come similar to this one that I was involved with, with him at the University of Illinois. Uh, he and I also uh, had the privilege of having a grant that allowed us to actually uh, materialize some things and take this kind of training, this idea of low-resource individuals, you know, that may not have every break in the world, and we showed them business processes by using 3D printers. Uh, you know, it was kind of a grounding, groundbreaking thing at the time where we were using 3D printers to teach business processes, uh, and especially in the design in the creative mode and the entrepreneurial aspect. And so that just kind of gravitated here. And I still, I'm very fortunate, I still teach. I still teach, thank you. I still teach at the University of Illinois uh, and teach sustainable business design uh, and sustainable business management uh, for them at an undergraduate and graduate level. But I'm, I'm very, very pleased about being here because I think this program, uh, as I have said to my sections before, if you'll pay attention here, you know, pay attention. If you'll pay attention here, the fundamental elements that you'll learn here about bottom-up, how to view a business model from a bottom-up perspective, will carry with you throughout the rest of your business education as well as your professional life. Okay, so this is a very fundamental course. It's different. It's not Accounting 101, and for anybody in Accounting 101, I'm sure you know that, but this has its own fundamental uh, discipline to it, and uh, I'm just pleased to be a part of it. One more? Uh, yes, yeah, please. please, and there yeah. was one more over here as well. Yes, this is important. Yeah, yeah. please. Yes, and that is the impact of climate change. Uh, climate change was one of those things that was, you know, well down on the list of elements that you would talk about in terms of, you know, what are stressing people right now, right? Usually it's like, okay, economic turned down, 2008, the whole bank fiasco pile, all these things were there, and, you know, the climate was kind of down here. What we're finding now is that's starting to climb up. Uh, dislocation. Dislocation because of the the now changing environmental considerations for areas where many people go. I'm so uh, you know think about the Maasai, and you know what they're facing. Uh, Professor Badu and I have been very very fortunate to have friends and associates there in the Maasai tribe land areas, and they're suffering because again the rains are changing, the timing of the rains are changing, and again remember they live 
at the precipice of the environment. It's about being in the environment. That's where they live. And so any environmental change that takes place, positively or negatively, they benefit or suffer from. And so we've seen more, I think I've seen more impact on climate change and some of the off-fall from that from a government societal level than almost any other thing that I can see that's, that's prescient and really coming on. And it will only increase. It's only going to increase more so. I missed a person there. I think oh, you had a question, right, over here? Did you get to ask? Somebody over somebody here. Or anybody else? This? Good. So let me do one thing, uh, Ron, just so I give people time to debrief. I just uh, also wanted to mention Ron's done amazing work in correctional facilities. And we had the honor of people who had uh, so many years to reflect uh, telling us that, look, they talk about rehabilitation, but the program that Ron led, it was a livelihood of uh, agriculture combined with uh, marketplace work, see, was really well received. So he has a lot of experience in that sector. I love to go and watch him do that as well. So uh, thank you, Ron.